So I was staying at a hotel with my mom when I was around 16 years old. We were in town for a concert and I really wanted to go swimming at the indoor pool. My mom was adamant that she didn't want to go with me. I told her that she didn't really have to and that I could go alone perfectly fine. She was very hesitant about that though. She thought I was surely going to get nabbed by someone. I thought she was being overprotective and kind of ridiculous, honestly. I got my swimsuit on and told my mom that I was going to the pool, whether she liked it or not. She yelled at me that I was being a stubborn brat and I slammed the door behind me. I made my way downstairs and through the hall that led to the pool. I needed a room key to get in and I was glad that I'd remember to take one with me. When I entered the pool room, I was kind of disappointed to see so many other people in there. There were at least 10 kids in the pool and even more adults as well. I didn't want to go back to my room though, because I knew my mom would make some snooty comment, and I just didn't really want to hear it at that moment. I set my stuff down on a nearby chair and decided to go in the deep end, away from all the smaller children. It was nice because it was a heated pool, so it wasn't freezing like it would usually be in some other places. I was hanging out for around 10 minutes or so when I noticed a man walking all alone. He was probably in his 60s, I would say. I remember feeling kind of creeped out by him just on the initial glance. He hadn't done anything, nor did he really even look at me, but he was exuding this weird sort of feeling. You know, it's that kind of feeling you get when you know someone has bad intentions without them really having to do anything. He got in the pool and made his way over to the deep end near me. He was about five feet away when he started making some small talk with me. He was asking me questions about school and different things I was interested in. I tried ignoring him, but he was very stubborn on getting me to talk to him. I tried politely telling him I didn't talk to strangers, but he did that thing that creeps always do. He introduced himself and then said, well, we aren't strangers anymore. Then he started to laugh almost like Pennywise the Clown. I was getting weirded out to the extreme and told this guy to please just leave me alone. I got out of the pool and actually decided to skip on over to the hot tub. I thought I'd be safer with some other adults around me. I was horrified to see the man immediately jump out of the pool and slip into the hot tub right next to me. He made this weird moaning sound and said the water felt so great with me in it. He also moved his leg to touch mine. I moved to the other end of the tub and he made a face at me like he was disappointed or something. I sat there trying my best not to look at him and just enjoy being in the warm water. Of course, he had to ruin it by being a creep again. I felt someone's foot rubbing all over mine, a caressing feeling, not just an accidental touch. I couldn't see well through the water because of the jets creating the bubbles, but it was very obvious who it was that was doing this. I looked up at the man, and he had this big smirk on his face. He actually mouthed something at me that I didn't quite pick up at first, but when he did it a second time, I understood him perfectly. How do you like that? I stood up out of the water at that moment and yelled at him, calling him a pervert. I told the adults in the hot tub that this guy was following me around and trying to play footsie with me. Thankfully, a few of the other adult men got the man and took him out of the pool room. I thanked them and they assured me I would be safe in there with them. Their wives also comforted me and asked if I wanted them to walk me back to my room. Of course, I was still being stubborn and didn't want to prove my mother right, so I just stayed there for another hour before they all had to leave. There were a couple of other families in there with me still, so I still felt safe. I closed my eyes and leaned back against the wall of the tub when I felt the water shift in a way that meant someone else had just gotten in. I saw the man from earlier sit down right across from me and he gave me that same awfully creepy smirk like before. 
This time, though, when he whispered, it was a warning to me. He told me my room number and said that if I screamed or made any sound, he would go to my room and do something horrible to my mother. I was scared. I wanted to scream and cry, but I was also only 16, and I didn't realize I had more control over the situation than I thought I did. I sat there in silence and watched in horror as he came over and sat right next to me. He was so close I could feel his legs intertwining with my own. He set his hand on my thigh. Tears started rolling down my face. It kept building up until I realized I didn't have to just sit there and let this guy do this to me. I stood up and jumped out of that hot tub like my life depended on it. The man was still seated when I pulled my leg back, so I ended up kicking him in the back of the head as hard as I could. The other families began yelling, and one of the women came rushing over. She asked what happened, and when I explained everything, she started yelling at the now clearly concussed man. He was clearly furious. He even tried to lunge at me and attack me. I was thankful when the woman who came over leaned down and grabbed onto his hair and started to pull it hard. Another woman came out of nowhere and kicked him directly in the face. This time, and I kid you not, this dude just got knocked straight out. It turned out the woman had overheard everything. They were about to get in the hot tub and do something anyway, and that's when I decided to get up and run. I ended up running down the hall anyway and up the stairs. I banged on the hotel room door, and my mom answered. I was sobbing, and she pulled me inside. She was frantically asking me what happened. I was able to tell her what happened after a bit of calming down. When I did, she was obviously furious. She told me to stay in the room, and she'd be back. Next thing I knew, she came back with blood on her. She told me the man wouldn't be messing with anyone again. I asked her what happened, but she wouldn't tell me. The police came knocking on our door later that night. They questioned both of us about the events of that day. My mother had already changed her clothes. They never asked her about her involvement. It seems the man had been found floating unconscious surrounded by blood in the hot tub. He survived and was arrested and taken to the hospital. We didn't get any updates on his condition. We were glad about that because we didn't really want to know. Frankly, I didn't even care. He was charged with assault of a minor. This also wasn't his first offense. And given the state we were in, I know his sentence must have been pretty long. We were just happy to get justice. Not just for me, but also the other girls that he'd probably hurt in the past. My mom had a lot of extreme guilt for letting me go to the pool that day alone. I tried telling her it wasn't her fault, but I don't think there's anything I'll be able to say to make her feel better about it. I'm sad there are people in the world like that, and even sadder that most of them never get caught. So it was the summer of 2012. I was in my early 20s, living in a small town that seemed maybe a little bit stuck in the past. My group of friends and I were always trying to find new and exciting ways to spend our time together, and unfortunately, curiosity got the better of us. You see, we had heard some rumors about an abandoned hotel on the outskirts of town. We decided it might be interesting or even a little creepy to go exploring. I guess when you're bored of your mundane life, even something terrifying is better than just staying in bed all night long. Little did we know that this decision would lead to a night we would never forget. The hotel had been vacant for as long as I could remember. It was a massive, imposing building that stood at the edge of the woods, gradually being consumed back by nature. The plants surrounding it were so overgrown that it was almost hard to even find a way in. Stories about the hotel varied from person to person, but one thing that was always consistent was that you were never supposed to go there after dark. We were idiots and figured we had some kind of strength in numbers, so we packed our flashlights and headed out just as the sun was setting. It was really foggy that night. 
I remember my friends and I gathered at the edge of the woods. I also remember my heart was beating really fast. At that moment, I started getting second thoughts about even being there, but everyone else was so excited. I didn't want to be the one person to bring everyone else down. As we approached the hotel, our initial impression was that it was just a really eerie structure. It probably wasn't as dangerous as everyone made it seem. I even thought that maybe it was all just a scary story, like your parents would tell you to actually keep you from going there. The windows were all shattered, and the once grand entrance was now just this big gaping hole. The graffiti-covered walls and overgrown bushes added to the already creepy vibe I was getting. We cautiously entered the building, flashlights in hand. The inside of the lobby was filled with torn-up old furniture and faded wallpaper, peeling away from the walls. We talked to each other about how it must have looked like when it was still open, and how weird it was that everything had just been left there to rot. We explored the ground floor, poking our heads into dark rooms. My friends started telling ghost stories to try and freak the rest of us out. Every creaking floorboard made us jump, but we laughed it off as we made our way up the steps to the next floor. Once we were on the second floor, we stumbled upon some things that made it obvious we weren't the only ones who'd ventured into that place. Sleeping bags, empty food cans, scattered belongings. It made it clear there were probably some people squatting there. It was disconcerting to not be alone, but not entirely unexpected either. After all, an abandoned building in the middle of nowhere where you wouldn't have to worry about police would be the perfect place to stay if you were homeless or down on your luck. We decided to skip this area and move to the third floor then onto the fourth as well. We'd heard the fourth floor was the spookiest anyway, so we wasted no time getting up there. The higher we ascended, the more damage we noticed around. The floorboards were falling apart, and the building just seemed more sketchy up there. We were making our way through the different rooms, trying to be careful and not fall through the floor or something. That was when I started to feel as though someone was watching us, I dismissed the feeling at first. I thought it was probably just my mind playing tricks on me. I mean, I'm sure anyone exploring a creepy abandoned location would probably feel the same way. As we reached the top floor, we discovered an open door that led out to a rooftop patio. It was a spectacular view, but something was off here. We all got very quiet. Then, as clear as day, we heard a muffled conversation coming from a nearby room. Our hearts started racing, and we cautiously approached that room. I started to beg my friends to just come with me, and that we could all leave right now, but they were determined to find out if there were other people there. The door was slightly ajar. We peeked in, and inside there were three men sitting around a small table, it was pretty obvious these guys were getting ready to do some substances of some sort. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but they were clearly startled to see us there. For a moment, we all froze. My friend Alex stepped forward and tried to strike up a conversation, explaining that we had only come to explore the building. He was met with silence, and I could feel the tension in the room growing thicker, one of the men finally spoke up, and his gross voice was filled with hostility. You shouldn't have come here. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I realized we were finding ourselves in a dangerous situation, far beyond what I'm sure any of us could handle. This was their home, and to them, we were the trespassers. One of the other men was visibly agitated. He pulled out a knife and started to rush towards Alex with it. He managed to back away fast enough to avoid getting stabbed. The other two men got up quickly to back up their friend, though. Alex yelled at us to run. We all started sprinting down the steps. The wood crumbled as each of us ran, one after another. Alex was in the back, and the three men were not far behind. 
Just as we were nearing the bottom floor, Alex tripped and fell down a flight of stairs. I watched in horror as he landed with a thud on the lobby floor. He seemed to have been knocked unconscious. We were all screaming. His girlfriend Beth rushed over to him. We stood between him and the three men, but my mind was telling me we were all going to die that night. I looked at the men and wondered what was going to happen next. To my surprise, one of the men spoke up. I hope your friend isn't hurt. We weren't trying to hurt you, we just wanted to scare you a little bit. We do it with all these damn kids coming into our house here. He put his knife away. We just didn't want y'all coming back, that's all. Get your friend and get out of here. We're really sorry, just don't send anybody back here, alright? I was looking into their eyes and the little bit of light we had, and realized that they were just as scared as we were. I knew that they were telling the truth, and really weren't there to hurt us. It was one of those wrong place, wrong time moments. If anyone was at fault, it was us. We should have just stayed away from that place to begin with. The three men ran back up the stairs. I looked back down at Alex, who now had his head in Beth's lap. She was begging for him to wake up. None of us had phone service, and we quickly realized we would have to carry him all the way back to the car. Thankfully, it wasn't too far, just at the edge of the woods. We were still an hour away from the nearest hospital, but we really had no other options. The car ride was hard, and Alex didn't wake up during the whole ride to the hospital. When we finally made it inside, they immediately took him to the back. Apparently, he had a brain bleed. When he woke up about a week later, he realized he couldn't feel the lower portion of his body. He had been permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Beth begged us to go to the police about what happened. She was furious over the permanent challenges Alex would have to face for the rest of his life. After talking to the rest of our friends, we decided to leave the decision up to him. He decided against reporting them to the police. The only thing it would do was ruin their lives, and one altered life was enough for a mistake. They never meant to hurt him in the first place, and he knew that. He was released from the hospital a few weeks later, and struggled with his disability for a long time. Beth decided to end their relationship not long after. She didn't understand why he refused to report the man to the police, and that decision was the reason they broke up. We were all just happy that even out of the relationship, she honored his decision and kept quiet about the events of that night. It's been a little over 11 years, and not all of us are still close friends. Alex and I actually ended up falling in love and getting married later on. Beth is still friends with all of us, although not as close as we once were. Alex doesn't let his life be defined by his disability. That night really changed our lives forever. So, long story short, I was kidnapped. It wasn't something I'd ever expect to happen to me, but it did, and it was the most horrific thing I've ever been through. The memories of that day have stayed with me for even years later. Now, I feel like I should give some background here. I was 25 and I had just quit my job. It was a boring cubicle job that made me feel like a part of me was just dying inside. No offense to anyone with a similar job, mind you. It's just that mine was so boring and so monotonous that I actually started to just kind of hate my life more and more every time I went in there. I hated it so much I quit without even giving two weeks notice. I just booked a plane out of the country that left the next week and packed a small bag of essentials, then set off to do a solo backpacking trip. I don't want to mention the country I went to because I don't believe it's an inherently unsafe place to visit, and I don't want this story to hurt its reputation in some way. I got off the plane and headed to the hostel I had booked the day before. I walked in and it was gross like all the reviews had said it would be, but I couldn't afford anything else in that particular country. I got into my bed and fell asleep. I was really hoping that one good night's sleep would get rid of the jet lag, 
and I would be able to function properly the next day. I woke up at around 5 a.m., which wasn't too bad. I wanted to sleep in a little bit later, but my brain just wouldn't let me. I got out of bed and grabbed my backpack and headed out for the day. The goal was to try some of the local street food. I'd watched a lot of videos about how great it was in that country and figured it would be one of the safer things I could do as a solo traveler. I spent most of the morning trying to find somewhere that was serving food early, but didn't have much luck. Throughout the day, I'd noticed a lot of the locals staring at me as I walked down the streets of their country completely alone. At around 2 p.m., I found a vendor along a busy street that was selling a type of fruit I'd never tried before. I bought some and sat on the curb a few feet away. The fruit tasted amazing, but after a couple of minutes, something seemed to really off. I started to feel nauseous and had this feeling of being intensely tired. I tried to stand up. I thought maybe walking around would help, but when I lifted myself off the curb, my legs felt like jello beneath me. I fell back down and started to call out for help. I was going to black out, and I knew it. I knew it was going to be pretty bad, considering that I was completely alone and no one was ever going to come help me. Just before my eyes closed, I saw people pull up in front of me. The door to a vehicle opened, and a couple of men got out and stood beside me. It was at that point I lost all memory. I woke up in what looked to be a relatively nice hotel room. There were two beds, a large flat-screen TV, and a large bay window that looked out onto the city. I could tell we were in a room high up in the building, so there wouldn't be an option to escape through the windows. I looked around the room to try and see if there was anyone else in there. I was sitting next to the dresser and couldn't see the door that led out onto what I'm assuming was the hallway. I spoke out. Is anyone there? Be quiet. He'll hear you. It's better if he thinks you're asleep. I could hear the voice that answered me, but I couldn't see the person who'd said it. I knew it appeared to be a woman, and she seemed to have a slight accent. Who's he? Now I was desperate to know more, but she just shushed me immediately. Just be quiet. We'll both get in trouble for talking. I stopped. I was confused and scared. But I knew well enough to listen to someone when they said I'll get hurt for making noise. My hands were tied behind my back. I shifted side to side while I tried to get free. I made a couple of thumping sounds, but I stopped the second I started to hear footsteps. They were coming from the bathroom. Just before the door opened, the girl offered me one more warning. Pretend you're still asleep. He only likes to play when you're awake. I closed my eyes and tried to calm my breath. What she had just said to me made my heart beat faster than it ever had, though. Sitting there on that hotel floor, I wished so badly I had never quit my job, and I had just stayed and worked at that depressing cubicle, because at least then I wouldn't be here, wondering what was about to happen. Was I about to be tortured? Was I about to die? In the next few minutes, I heard the bathroom door open. Footsteps vibrated on the floor, and I felt the person get closer to me. With each step they took, I wanted to scream. I felt a hand placed on my shoulder. They shook me hard, but I kept my eyes closed and continued to pretend to be unconscious. They shook me harder and harder, to the point where it even began to hurt, but I was determined to live, determined to never find out what that woman meant by play with me. When they realized I wasn't going to wake up, I knew that whoever this was was going to her next. He moved further away from me. I listened as he began to shake her violently. She was not able to keep up the act and yelled out in pain. I couldn't help but open my eyes to see what was going on. There was this large and heavy man. I was scared as I watched him grab up a woman and carry her away. She was some petite woman, dirty and disheveled and she looked like she had been there for quite a long time. The man's back was turned toward me. As he took her to the bathroom, she looked me in the eyes and mouthed two words at me. Get out. The door closed behind them. 
Hearing her beg him not to hurt her made me want to cry. Loud music started to play behind the door, and I knew if I was ever going to get a chance to escape, it was this moment. I was able to stand up by leaning my back against the wall and sliding myself upward. Once I was on my feet, I quietly made my way over to the door. There was one lock, and I had one chance to open it and run for my life. I wasn't sure if the man was going to be able to hear the door open, but if he could, I had to act fast. I actually had to grab the lock between my teeth and try to turn it until I heard it click. I turned around and grabbed the handle with my hands still tied behind my back. The door opened, and the music in the bathroom immediately stopped. I knew at that moment I needed to run. The bathroom door opened, and the man began yelling. I sprinted down the hallway and managed to slip into an elevator. There were people inside looking at me with wide eyes. I was begging them to get help, to call the police, but not one of them could understand what I was saying. The elevator stopped in the lobby. I ran to the front desk. Thankfully, there was someone there who understood what I was saying. They were able to cut my wrists loose and put me in one of the offices in the back, where I waited 20 minutes for local authorities to arrive. I was questioned by a few officers, who had a hard time understanding me. I led them to the room I was being kept in. When they opened the door and searched the room, the man and the woman were gone. In that moment, I felt heartbroken, but not for me. I wanted desperately to help her. She looked so scared and broken. I really thought she'd still be in there, and maybe I could help her. They found my backpack in one of the drawers, and basically told me I could just leave. No investigation was going to be done, considering I guess there was no evidence. The hotel had no security cameras, and they couldn't just go off my word. I headed straight from the hotel to the airport, and got on the next flight I could home. I didn't want to spend one more night in that country. I arrived home and decided to stay with my parents for quite some time. I gave up my apartment and spent well over a year too terrified to even leave the house. I couldn't even sleep because every time I closed my eyes, I thought of that woman again. I tried going to the authorities in my country, but they also said there was nothing they could do. I felt helpless. I wish I could say in the end that my life got better and I learned something from this experience, but that would be a lie. I had crippling anxiety and can barely function outside the house. I only started to grocery shop for myself again just this past year. I'm 28 now, and I still live with my parents. I work from home doing a job that requires no human interaction. I wish I would have kept that job and had a boring life. Anything would be better than the hell I'm living through right now. We were called at 2 a.m. to a little town in the hills away from our area. Someone had called with chest pain and said they needed an ambulance ASAP. It took us a while to get up there because the road weaved around the mountainside and had no railings for protection. We drove into the area and there were no lights on at all except for a phone box lit up on the street. The address was actually a little ways out on the other side of town, about three kilometers or so. When we got to the street that had been indicated, we found no street numbers anywhere. It was very hard to see where we were going, but we soon found a shack hidden behind some trees. The GPS seemed to point to this being the general area we were supposed to go. We pulled up and knocked on the door. No answer. I knocked again. After about a minute, a woman stepped in from the edge of the door, dressed in all white and not saying a word. She stood there with her nose pressed against the screen, her eyes extremely wide. I asked if she had called for an ambulance, and she shook her head rapidly. I asked if anyone else had. I could see another figure in white standing further back in the house. No lights were turned on and no one was saying a word. We got back into the ambulance and kept searching. We drove down to the end of the road, which ended in a property with this huge house. The yard was full of old cars. 
No lights were on in the house. We tried to call and radio our communications center, but we were unable to get to them due to the remote location. We drove back into town and decided to use the phone booth to call communications about this. We got a hold of them and they told us they had no further information for us. We'd have to just look around. As directed, we drove back down the road and tried to get another look for the caller. We couldn't find anything matching the house description we'd been given. We had trouble even finding any driveways at all. Finally, we got all the way to the end of the street and looked up into the huge house at the end of the road again. This time, a single light was on in the front room, and standing out looking away from us into darkness was a figure dressed all in black with this huge pointed hood. We waited, terrified, to see if this was the caller. They didn't move despite us doing everything we could to get their attention. After what seemed like forever, we just drove away from that house, up the road and through town, back down the curling mountain roads, until we got back on the highway. Neither of us really knew what to make of what was going on there. Once we arrived back into mobile phone range, we called the communications center to explain that we couldn't find the patient despite further searches. The lady on the other end of the phone explained that they'd tried to reach the caller again but were unable to do so despite trying many times. They ended up tracing the call and found it came from the phone booth in town. I hung up the phone and we both sat silently for the ride home. At that point, my partner asked me if I believed in the devil. I told her I don't really know. So about three years ago, I was taking a year off from college. I was back in my tiny hometown in the Midwest. I had lots of friends in the area, and we used to love to go out to groves, abandoned buildings, anywhere else really to shoot coons, skunks, possums, and the occasional coyote. Yes, it was a pretty redneck pastime, but we also got paid for it. One night, I think around late March or early April, springtime was right around the corner, as there was still snow on the ground. Six of us went to an old abandoned house, a decent ways away from town. As we drove up to this location, it looked like your average abandoned house. Tall grass all over the yard, including the driveway, broken windows, etc. As we all got out of the truck, we noticed there was a female mannequin's head tied by her hair on a windowsill on the second story. We ignored this weird sight and started moving to the front door, which we quickly discovered was locked. Now, this is where I usually like to call it and find somewhere else to go, but one of our friends crawled through a broken window and let us inside. Right off the bat, something was wrong here. Although there was no furniture or anything else to show a person was occupying the house in quite a long time, there was also no dust at all. I pointed out this discrepancy and was told to stop being a little wuss by my friends. We walked through the main floor and didn't really find anything. Then we checked out the basement. The basement was full of these mason jars, easily 1,000 of them or more. I said something was definitely up here and we should get out of there. Once again, my friends told me to man up. They even acted out and smashed a few of the jars before I convinced them to stop that and just go upstairs if they wanted to. We climbed back up to the main floor, then to the second story. When we got to the top level, I split off from the rest of the group. I pulled out a knife and cut that weird mannequin head down. I was looking at it in my hand when my friends called out to me and told me to check out what they'd found. I ran to them and found three sleeping bags, some old bikes, lots of shoes, and some Mountain Dew bottles. This is where we all decided it would be best to get out of here. Once we were out of the house, we waited by our pickup truck while we decided where to go next. We figured no one was at the house at the time, so maybe we could do a quick sweep of the barn and corn crib and then leave. 
We went to the barn and shed a quick light in on it, but didn't really see anything of interest inside. We headed for the corn crib instead. I'm not sure why, but I was walking alone to the crib, with one friend following me by about 15 feet. The others had decided to stay at the shed for some reason. I was getting close to it, and had my eyes on my gun, checking it over to make sure everything was right with it, when my friend shouted, Holy shit, did you see that? I just saw something move through the window on the second story. He ran up to me. I took out a flashlight and shined it at the window. I didn't see anything, but a weird glint of light caught my eye on the main story. I shined my light over to the main floor of the crib and was surprised to find blood everywhere. I'm getting goosebumps all over just typing this. When I mean blood, I don't just mean a little bit of it. There was blood running down the wall from the second story, all over the wall, even starting to drip and pool on the floor. We got the hell out of there ASAP. Later that year in June or so, I told that story to a girl I liked. She didn't seem to believe me. I ended up getting into my truck and driving to that house in the middle of the day just to prove that it really did happen. I put my high beams on the crib without ever leaving the truck. I was surprised to find that the dried blood was still clearly visible right there. There was a huge amount of it too, more than I even remembered. The summer after, the barn next to the corn crib burned down. The sheriff's department said a moonshine installment had gone wrong, and people operating it fled the area. I still have no idea why there was so much blood there. It wasn't even mentioned in the report at all. This is not a paranormal story, which seems to be the trend here, but this is by far the most creeped out I've ever been. I, 27 and female, was hooking up a TV for an old man I know, who was 63 years old at the time. After I finished plugging everything in, I asked him to turn it on and put on NASCAR so I could make sure the aspect was right. He turned on IFC, which was playing some soft core neural. He proceeded to watch it and asked me if I'd seen this movie and if I knew what it was about. I looked over and saw a chick getting railed from behind on the screen. I responded with, Yeah, I think I get the gist of it, but uh, hey, how about that NASCAR? He went to the guide and went down a couple of channels and put on this thing called the Cleveland Abduction. It was a weird scene and he asked me if I had seen this one. He said he'd seen it many times, and it was so good. He started telling me how it's about three kidnapped girls being kept as sex slaves. At this point, I was freaking out, texting everybody where I was. Honestly, I thought I was about to be raped and killed or something. I at least wanted them to know where to start looking for my body. The man watched the entire rear scene, while constantly asking me questions about it. I just kept trying to get him to change the channel, and then said I needed to get going because I had friends waiting. He agreed to change the channel, but only changed it to some other weird thing. I texted my friend, 911, call me now. She called up and acted like she was at the hospital, and said I had to get there right now. At this point, the man looked between me and the door many times. He finally typed in the channel for NASCAR, which proved he knew what he was doing all along. I just got the hell out of there. It was the creepiest interaction I've ever had. I'm not sure what the old man's plan was, but I'm sure I really wanted no part of it. Okay, so back when I was in college, there were a number of break-ins reported from various apartment complexes that all lined a single street. You could easily walk from one complex to another in just a few minutes. A lot of these units had large back porches that you shared with your neighbor. The kicker is that below the porches, there were these big air conditioner-like things. You could easily climb up onto these things and hop up onto the porch. Since a lot of college kids left their doors unlocked, 
it was incredibly easy to get into someone's apartment. And the reports were all from women who awoke in the middle of the night, sometimes even during storms, to find a man just standing over their bed watching them sleep. If you woke up, he would run out of the home. I thought it was creepy, but I didn't really think that much of it. I was taking a summer astronomy class, and it was a lecture followed by a lab. Since we needed it to be nighttime to do the lab, often I wouldn't get home until around 12 p.m. or so. It was a five-hour class in total, so I would often go home and go to bed, completely exhausted. One night, I did this as normal. None of my other three roommates were there at home at the time. The next morning, I woke up to my roommate, telling me the cops were there and they wanted to talk to me. I went downstairs. Apparently last night, they had caught the man during a break-in, lurking around our apartment complex. They asked the man to show him all the places he had broken into. Apparently, he pointed to mine. It was then my roommate told us he came home late last night and the back door was wide open. We think he was trying to enter as my roommate came home, and upon hearing my roommate, hurried out the back door without closing it. It didn't even occur to me until much later, though, that that wasn't the only night unaware to me that he had entered our home and watched me sleep. 